Thank you very much, Lucas. Let me just share my screen. One second. Can everybody see that okay? Perfect. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Okay, great. Okay. Great. Uh, also, thank we you. do now see bicycles. Bicycle. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Apologies. Let me try that again. That's just a image of my most recent holiday to be all just. How's that? I think that's better. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, as much as you'd love to see uh, the lakes in Scotland, uh, we're actually going to be talking about data reuse today. Uh, so thank you, Lukash, for that uh, uh, introduction. And thank you to the Track Standing Committee for uh, uh, accepting my proposal to talk to you today. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is the issue of data reuse in archaeology and specifically the effect of digital literacy on reuse practices. And then what I really want to do is focus on Roman studies more specifically uh, through the lens of the Roman Rural Settlement Project, which is an archive that we hold here at the ADS, both as a case study for the level of reuse that we're seeing of our archives at the ADS, but also as an example in uh, to show you how you could use this data yourself in your own research. And uh, there's some training materials that accompany this talk, uh, which I'll talk about at the end. OK, so uh, as part of this talk, you may have received a survey link. Um, this is uh, information. I was trying to draw information about the levels of data literacy of the people who were uh, attending today uh, and their knowledge about the Roman Rural Settlement Project. This link is still live. And so if you, you still want to participate in this survey, that would be appreciated uh, by us at the ADS because it uh, gives us a level of understanding in terms of data reuse of our archives. Uh, and what I'll be doing is, uh, based on the 30 or 40 responses that I got, I'll be smattering in uh, a levels of, uh, of what uh, people's responses were to kind of give an indication of uh, what I'm saying and, and, and how that relates to the real world. So if uh, for you, for those of you who are familiar with uh, 1990s TV in the UK, you may know Les Dennis and Family Fortunes. Um, when you see his little face up, then I'm going to be talking about what our survey says, and I'll uh, uh, I'll give some statistics about um, uh, what the survey has told us about um, uh, um, digital literacy and, uh, and and how data reuse can be used. So, really, what underpins all of our understanding about data reuse is uh, the fair data principles, which many of you may be uh, familiar with. These have been adopted more widely by um, science um, and open science more generally and archaeology over the last few years. And uh, many of the leading archaeologists in, in digital research and those who produce and interpret digital data now adhere to the kind of FAIR data principles. FAIR stands for uh, findable, accessible and interoperable and reusable. This is the principles in which we should uh, focus on in terms of um, how we present our data and how we share our data um, more generally in archaeology and, and, and sciences more generally. How that works in practice in terms of archaeology is multifaceted. There's lots of different activities that uh, data creators and uh, data archivists undertake in order to under in order to make sure that data that is produced by archaeology is fair. Um, and these include elements such as using persistent identifiers, uh, the appropriate level of metadata. This is the information that describes our data. Um, it's about um, ensuring that our data is free and open access and online, uh, that it can be preserved for the long term, uh, and that we're using a standardized vocabulary that we have references between our data and the publications in which they are referenced. Um, and in terms of reusability, that both we have data licenses which show people what the data can be used for and in what manner, and also the necessary contextual information, the descriptive information that goes along with that data to, to give people an idea of how it was created 
who it was created by and for what reason. Uh, and that's really crucial in, uh, uh, in being able to reuse this data in the future. What underpins, um, in archaeology at least, um, how we make our data fair is the use of digital archives or data repositories. Uh, and these organizations, uh, as many of you may already know, they uh, collect, store, and preserve digital data um, for long-term preservation. They ensure that standardized practices are used so that metadata is accompanying all of the data which they receive uh, and archive. And they also catalog that data, so it makes it more accessible for people that they can search it using uh, their own internal catalogs, but that they can also link to external catalogs. So as part of the wider understanding of, uh, of archaeology, that we can search some of this data out, find it, and hopefully reuse it in the, in the future. Now, there are a number of different types of data repositories, and it would be fair to say that the different usage of, the, of those repositories or archives is based on geographical location and types of data. So I work for the Archaeology Data Service. We're based here in the UK, and we deal primarily with UK-based data. But there are also other repositories, including TDAR, the, the Digital Archaeological Record based in the US. Uh, and for more acade broad academic usage, uh, uh, repositories such as Zenodo, which uh, in archaeological context at least, tend to be used for supplementary data that accompanies uh, publications such as uh, journal articles. So here's our first question uh, that I posed as part of the thing and uh, as part of the survey that I introduced. Uh, and as I asked people as part of their own research, have they ever deposited data in an online repository? And here were the answers. The, the vast majority of you said that, that, that yeah, I hadn't. And I do realize that there are barriers to uh, depositing data in an online uh, repository, uh, the least of which is, uh, or the most of which is cost, uh, that it costs money to preserve data for the long term. Uh, and I'm hoping as I go through this talk and I talk a little bit more about the, the benefits of data um, archiving and sharing uh, that you might reconsider by, by the end. And I'll give you some, uh, some uh, hopefully some guides and hints and uh, maybe some uh, ways of uh, uh, overcoming that cost aspect. So I think it's important to stop here and to even ask, why should we share and archive data? Uh, and this for me uh, and for many others is kind of split into two kind of competing uh, um, uh, 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 ways of thinking about it, two different motivations uh, that you can characterize by the carrot and the stick, essentially. The stick being that we have a professional and ethical responsibility as ar uh, archaeologists to archive data, to make it uh, publicly uh, open access, particularly if we're talking about research projects which are publicly funded. Here in the UK, the Chartered Institute for Archaeologists are moving more into the direction that we should have all of our data open access and available. And uh, for research bodies, uh, grant funders, including the UKRI, it's becoming a requirement not only to have the outputs of, uh, or the traditional outputs such as publications, open access, but also the data that is created throughout these projects. So there's an element there that you, you should do it because you're forced to, but there's also another element which is that is beneficial to researchers more generally. Uh, and this includes uh, the ability to uh, create reproducible research and to test our archaeological interpretations and arguments uh, by collaborating with others and uh, uh, advancing our research by testing whether or not the this different types of approaches and methodologies can be used in different ways and in different um, uh, areas and in different periods. It's also uh, very much in terms of a, a resource uh, perspective, it, it avoids the duplication of effort. It saves us time and money. We're not all creating the same data sets over and over again, but we're reusing the data sets that we can uh, and archiving and adding to them and building from them. So uh, it's, it's both a requirement, but it's also a, a benefit to researchers as well. Now, here's where I talk about the archaeology data service and earn my uh, wage for the day. Uh, the ADS is an, a, one of uh, a small number of accredited digital archives for UK heritage data based here in the UK. Uh, we've been in operation for almost 30 years now. And as Lukash said in the introduction, uh, we're based 
here at the Department of Archaeology in the University of York. We deal with data primarily from UK based projects, and that comes from both commercial archaeology, such as industri industry, but also higher education research projects. We also do hold data for uh, archaeological investigations elsewhere in the world, but these are primarily uh, UK based researchers um, that have asked us to archive the data. And in where at all possible, we try to get them to archive in the most responsible um, place. So if that's uh, a more local data repository, if there, if one exists, then um, that's where we ask them to archive the data. This 30 years of working with archaeological data means that we now hold more than 3.5 million unique digital objects in over 300 different formats. Um, archaeological data is a unique in terms of uh, the different types of formats and the, the great variety of information that we uh, that we use uh, and therefore the great variety of different formats that we have to archive here at the ABS. Uh, and that comes with all sorts of difficulties and uh, uh, hurdles that we have to overcome to ensure their long term preservation. Um, the final thing to talk about is that we have been, uh, as uh, over the last decade or so, uh, part of a wider project, the Ariadne project, um, which is uh, experimenting with linked open data. Um, this is a, you know, a, a, a more ubiquitous thing now, and you can see the, the heat map here on the right hand side showing our data from the Ariadne portal. Um, and I'd recommend if you're interested in European archaeological research that it's a great resource to look at. Um, and I will share this um, presentation afterwards and, and you can use the links that I've uh, placed in the, in the PowerPoint. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the ADS, we have an annual report which we publish and you can look at our website. We've just refreshed our website as well. Um, so please uh, have a look there if you're, if you're interested. I also asked people through the survey whether or not people had uh, used any of the resources offered by the ADS and the vast majority had, which is great. Uh, it's great to know that um, the resources are there and they're being used by uh, the uh, archaeological community. Part of the reason to talk about the ADS is because of our data access and reuse policy. Um, we have uh, a lot of help and guidance on our website that you can uh, access via this link. Uh, which uh, describes how we make our, our data uh, fair, essentially. And part of that is uh, providing all of our archives uh, as open access. Um, we want to facilitate their reuse by the, the heritage community, but also the wider public if possible too. Um, and there's a lot of detail on that section of the website, which describes how we make, how we go about making your data that you archive with us findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, okay? So if you're interested uh, in those elements and how we go about it and how we facilitate those aspects for you, then there's a link there. So as part of uh, digital archives more generally, we spent a lot of time over the last 30 years uh, archiving data, preserving it for the long term, ensuring that it's there, that it's searchable via catalogs, that it's accessible for everywhere, that it's interoperable, that it's linked into other data sets. Uh, and the prevailing thought process was if it's there and if we uh, provide access to it, particularly open access to it, then people will reuse that data, right? Um, my colleague Holly always talks about uh, the, the view that if we build it, then surely they will come. Uh, and I'm afraid to say, that's not the case. That's not the case at all. Um, recent research into data reuse, uh, particularly by Jeremy Huggett, has shown that the, the, the levels of data sharing and data reuse in archaeology are relatively low, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, Jeremy has uh, actually examined the archives uh, and the data that we hold here at the ADS um, and um, demonstrated that we are really not getting the reuse potential from those archives, despite the ethical and legal obligations that, that we have to archive that data. Um, this is not just a, a digital problem, but a physical archive problem as well. And really kind of uh, one of the key aspects in terms of understanding data reuse and maybe facilitating greater data reuse in the future is asking what are we using this data for? Um, and the prevailing research uh, in terms of understanding how we might reuse it in the, in the future suggests that education and research are two big areas in which 
data archives, particularly archaeological data archives, could be could find greater to reuse. Now, we at the ADS have tried to um, uh, promote data reuse. We did a, a, an award ceremony uh, about seven or eight years ago now. We found it really difficult to attract people and entries uh, and facilitate um, people um, actually uh, showing us the way that they had reused data, which is uh, not hugely encouraging, but hopefully is building. Um, we also have an issue in terms of finding reused case data more generally. And this is because of the use of uh, digital object identifiers, which are really important for uh, being able to make our data findable. Um, and uh, the catalogs that we use to search out uh, data, um, other publications which have used our data, use those DOI identifiers, or the digit, digital object identifiers. However, where people have used URLs, for example, to our website, uh, we don't pick up that information. We really need the DOIs. So this is just a, a quick please uh, to say, please, if you do uh, reference ADS resources or any resources on data archives, please use the DOIs. It makes it a lot easier for people to find that data. And now I just want to roll into a little bit more of the Roman studies by providing an example of levels of data reuse in terms of um, uh, the ADS more specifically. And that's the uh, the Rural Settlement of Roman Britain project, um, which many of you are probably familiar with. But just to give you a brief overview, this was a collaborative project between Cotswold Archaeology, the University of Reading and the ADS. Um, which looked or and created a database of excavated evidence for rural settlement across Roman Britain. Uh, and what was key about this was that it incorporated both traditional publications and unpublished grey literature reports. So these were from developer funded excavations. It hadn't seen uh, the light of day at that point. And it allowed them to create this massive database, a really useful database of um, information, which was uh, eventually published in, in three open, uh, well, three volumes, which then may uh, were then which then became open access. OK, so they're three fantastic volumes. You can access them uh, via the ADS. They're part of the Britannia monograph series, if you uh, are interested. Um, and, but what also came alongside that output was an interface and the, the data sets as open access resources via the ADS. So I asked as part of the survey whether or not people had ever uh, viewed the Roman Rural Settlement Project online resource, and the vast majority of you have, which is great. You may have, or you probably viewed it through this medium, which is this special map interface that was created for the project. If you're familiar with ADS archives, not all of our archives have this type of interface. Um, it depends on the level of time and effort and resources that we have as part of a, a particular archive. This uh, interface is excellent because it allows you to see geographically the location of all of these sites and it allows you to filter by site type or date or evidence. Uh, and there's a whole host of evidence there where you can uh, um, uh, uh, use the filters for. But it also, uh, uh, um, crucially, it links to the grey literature reports from commercial archaeology, which we collect as part of the OASIS project. So if you click on a, a particular site and that data is available open access by the ADS, you can click straight through to the original resource and access that original data as well. And that's what makes it such a powerful um, uh, resource for people to use. What you may not be more aware of is the data download page, which is this list here of all of the database tables that form the larger database that was used as part of the project. OK, this data um, database or data download page includes all of the metadata that people require as part of understanding how the database works. And it also includes a database uh, entity uh, relationship table, how all of those tables fit together. But it's important to note that those database tables, which you can download as CSV files, um, aren't 
uh, downloadable as linked together. And that's because of the preservation project. In order to preserve this data for the long term, you need to be able to preserve them in a format and in a manner which is going to be have long term preservation needs. So there is a little bit of work to do there in terms of drawing that data together to reuse it. And I'll talk a bit about that later on. OK, so um, the Roman Rural Settlement Project, one of the reasons why I chose this and, and not just the Roman focus is it is one of our most popular archives. So here's the usage statistics since the, um, the database was uploaded on the ATS. We've had almost 450,000 page views of this particular resource, and it has been downloaded. And that's the, the download page I just showed you 85,000 times. So it's that people are looking at this data and they are downloading information from this data. And we're hoping, or we were hoping, that they would be able to reuse it as well. However, when we look at our citation statistics, so this is uh, publications that use the DOI from this project resource, we are not finding a huge amount of citations. In total, when I did uh, a search of multiple data sets, including Google Scholar, Web of Science, et cetera, I found almost 30 citations, which sounds not too bad. However, once you start filtering out the uh, erroneous information from those citations, i.e. the ones where the DOI has been spelt incorrectly, therefore they, it wasn't really a citation to our data set, or where people have just cited the project more generally and not cited uh, uh, weren't reusing the data, they were just talking about the project, or citations from authors of the project, which isn't technically data reuse, um, but um, includes uh, wouldn't include those uh, times where that data has been reused by the authors, then we get down to 10 citations for the reuse of data, um, which considering the time and effort and resources that it took to undertake that project, to build that database and to archive the, the data, 10 uh, isn't a huge amount. Uh, and this is one of our most popular archives. Encouragingly, uh, of those 10, three were from doctoral research, which suggests that maybe early career researchers are looking for these data sets and reusing them as part of their research. And we're hoping that this uh, natural progression might help uh, the, um, the reuse of this data in the future. It's important to note as well that not all of the projects which are reusing the data are entirely visible, in part because uh, they're in progress. So as part of uh, giving this talk, I was contacted by Dr. Alex Mullen from the University of Nottingham, who is using this data as part of their ERC project, Latin Now. Uh, and this is a fantastic example of the reuse of this type of data, but also the collation of different multiple of data from multiple projects, including the Roman inscriptions of Britain online and the Portal Antiquity Scheme uh, to draw together to kind of understand this interdisciplinary subject. Um, and the, the there's a version online at the moment, but it is only a beta version because the project is ongoing. But it just shows you that just because the, the um, uh, data hasn't yet been cited, it doesn't mean that it won't be cited in the future. And I'd ask that if any of you have reused data as part of this project, it'd be great to hear from you. It's one of the things that we struggle with is really finding these data reuse examples. Which is why I asked as part of the survey whether or not any of you have downloaded data from the Roman Rural Settlement Project. Uh, and more than half of you said yes, so that's encouraging. Uh, and I asked, have you ever used data from the project as part of your research? And again, more than half of you said yes. That's important in terms of you know, the, the framing of the question there was necessarily broad. It wasn't, are you reusing it and citing it as part of your publication, but also to show that data reuse as part of these projects is maybe sometimes a little broader than just reusing the data and publishing it, which I'll talk about now. So why should we reuse the data in, in general? I mean, well, some of that uh, that um, impetus, some of that um, uh, reasoning comes from the same sort of uh, um, things that we were talking about when we're thinking about data sharing and data archiving, which is that archaeological investigation is inherently destructive. Um, if we are to be a more sustainable subject, then perhaps we need to look at some of the 
uh, reuse of uh, some of this data rather than necessarily always uh, um, getting primary data from the field. Not necessarily, not saying that uh, primary data collection isn't important as well. Um, also, as my time as a, a postdoc on various projects, um, I've done a lot of data collection and data creation of databases, um, and it's a time-consuming and costly uh, effort, and frankly, uh, sometimes boring as well. So, you know, if we can get past that by reusing data, then I think that's important. Uh, some of the projects I've worked on spent more than half of the time of the project creating databases for them to then uh, uh, analyze um, where the data reuse aspect could shorten that time down and allow us to undertake more analysis as part of our research funding rather than just uh, uh, having to create databases from scratch. In terms of uh, research potential as well, there are different ways in which you can use this data which help your research skills. They, they can allow you to uh, provide a baseline, uh, a context for your wider subject matter. You can reuse data to, to show um, gap analysis in certain elements. And I'll talk about that a, a little bit later on when I'm uh, focusing on uh, how I've reused data. Um, but it also allows you to have um, exposure to the ways that other researchers collect their data and the methods and tools that they under, that they use to undertake analysis, which can help you to improve your own skills, improve your own research skills, and also improve the way that you share information and share data in, in the future. There's a recent uh, volume in the, uh, uh, the uh, Journal of Archaeological Practice which talks about um, the ability to draw some of these big data sets that we're seeing together and big data more generally in archaeology in order to enable researchers to answer more complex questions about the past. And this will only be achieved if we really go around and reuse some of these data sets and face some of the challenges that uh, that entails. So we asked as part of the survey whether or not people had used secondary research um, from an online repository that was collected by others as part of their research work. And a, a vast majority said yes, and probably for many of the reasons that I just said, rather than just necessarily producing publications. Although data reuse is, you know, we're seeing low levels of data reuse, there are definite benefits in uh, undertaking data reuse. It would be illegitimate to say that there aren't some extensive barriers to undertaking data reuse as well. Some of those are um, getting over kind of uh, sociological uh, viewpoints of how we look at data in certain uh, traditions, that whether or not people see data reuse as uh, accepted as a legitimate research? Is it necessarily, uh, are, if you don't create the data yourself, are you just building off of somebody else's research? Uh, and that, to that I'd say, um, they probably have never actually tried to reuse data because it is a lot harder than, uh, than people uh, like to make out. Um, it, there's also an element of trust. Do you trust the person that has created that data uh, how they collected it, what assumptions that they made, what definitions did they use. And this is where um, rich metadata, contextual information, uh, and properly fair data uh, really comes into its own because it allows us to build that level of trust. And if you're archiving with a trusted repository as well, that can help in terms of trust issues too. Um, some interesting recent research as well has looked at whether or not data reuse actually may take longer data creation. And I think this is legitimate for some circumstances, um, particularly if you don't have the digital skills in order to undertake that data reuse. But also, as we all know, databases were created for particular reasons. Uh, and in order to transfer them or to manipulate them or wrangle them into the way that we need them, then it may take a lot of issue. Um, a, a lot of uh, issues and it might take a lot of time to in order to 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 get to that stage. Um, the next two in terms of communication are um, in part what I'm hoping that this talk will try and address today, which is communicating the existence of data sets, but also it communicating the benefits of data reuse. And it's only really through uh, talks such as these and going out and talking to uh, various audiences in which we can overcome these types of issues. Um, and then the final one, which I'll talk a little bit more on about in a second, is uh, digital literacy. You know, do people have the skills 
to be able to reuse data for their, or their own purposes. I should say that data reuse and the issues around it are becoming a research topic of its own. And if you haven't heard of this project before, it's called the Tetrox project. ADS is one of the members of the, the Tetrox project team, which started uh, at the end of last year. So it's relatively new. Um, they're going to be looking at some of the approaches to, to data reuse that we use and trying to improve them for the future and also make archaeological data more meaningful for a diverse range of audiences beyond the kind of scholarly or academic usage, um, but thinking about how it can be uh, used more uh, widely. And uh, um, this uh, project is going to be uh, posting some experimental type archives on the ADS in due course. So uh, please uh, have a look at that website and uh, keep an eye on the ADS for, for further information. In terms of digital literacy, this is uh, a crucial aspect in terms of uh, expanding the use of open access data. The ability to be able to communicate and understand and use digital tools is crucial in order to promote the reuse of uh, digital data, but itself is quite difficult to overcome, in part because technological changes occur and uh, too quickly uh, for kind of more traditional curriculum to catch up. If we're thinking about a university setting, you can't necessarily just change everything about your course on a year-to-year -year basis uh, just to keep up. It goes through checks and balances, and, uh, and those things need to be adhered to to ensure high-quality education. But also, it's an element of that the training needs for data literacy, digital literacy and data reuse, more specifically, are quite varied. They're quite, um, they include um, you know, communicating well how to use data sets and how and where they might be uh, located, but also how to access and use data from archival uh, from digital archives, how to use specific software that you might need in order to access that data, um, and really providing training resources for other people to use is going to be the way that we we go about this. And this recent paper uh, by Gartsky uh, has an appendices um, uh, that they developed a course in the US on uh, digital literacy and archaeology, which is extensive. And there's a lot of useful training information and resources there. So I'd recommend that if you're interested in improving your digital literacy or, or undertaking a course of digital literacy. So I asked as part of the survey whether or not people had undertake any formal training for database creation as part of their undergrad or postgrad degrees, and the vast majority uh, have said no, which seems to relate to, to the research that people are undertaking right now. I also asked whether or not there'd been any formal training in how to navigate and reuse the data on, from data repositories, and again, the vast majority said no. Um, now, this is one of the aspects which I hope to uh, readdress as the training manager at ADS. I've been in post for about five months now, so this is processes which are in, uh, in the works and should hopefully be rolled out uh, towards the end of this year. So please uh, keep an eye on, uh, on the ADS website if you're interested in training, particularly for research purposes. It's important here as well to, ha to have a little segue in terms of how what methods should we use to uh, uh, undertake our analysis, but also how to wrangle and manipulate the data for data reuse. And uh, I think uh, the large proportion of archaeologists would probably use uh, t um, uh, software such as Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Access. I think this is you know ubiquitous software that we all have uh, access to. Um, it's also got quite a lot of help menus and, and all of those things that you need in order to, to really do the data, to, to and analyze the data. Um, however, I'd argue, and this is something that I've been kind of training myself up in over the last five years, is in the use of R. Um, this is a, um, a coding language. It doesn't have to be R. It could be another type of coding language if that's your, um, uh, um, uh, 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 your preference. Um, but it allows us to have a reproducible workflow, which helps for our data to be fair. If you're sharing the code that lies behind a particular analysis, then people can see the exact methodologies that you're undertaking. And this is um, a a method of, of providing open methods in terms of what we think about in terms of science, not just open data. Um, so this is kind of the next step. So I'd, I'd recommend if you're interested in coding languages, 
uh, and maybe I haven't convinced you about not using Excel, there's an interesting blog post there by uh, Jumping Rivers, uh, which uh, compares the, the pros and cons in terms of using Excel and R. And uh, a paper there by uh, Schmidt and, and Marwick, which I'd very much uh, recommend in terms of if you're going to, to head in that direction. The benefit of using coding languages and using and uh, making your code available as part of your publication is that there is some research that there's a higher citation rate for publications that have code attached to them as supplementary data. So something to consider in the future. I asked as part of the survey, what software do people use? And this was an open question. So you could tick as many boxes as you wanted. And unsurprisingly, uh, uh, you know, fairly ubiquitous data um, software such as Excel or Access is used by quite a lot. Uh, maybe some of the other more complex uh, databases aren't used uh, here as in as much detail. But I'd recommend looking into using R if you're thinking about your own data uh, and you're thinking about data uh, reuse more generally because it becomes a little bit uh, easier, which I hope to demonstrate in a second. So the last section of this talk is really showing you how you could use or reuse data from the Roman Rural Settlement Project in your own research. And I'm going to demonstrate this through the use of uh, my own research. Uh, I am uh, interested in uh, structured deposition. I did some research on uh, structured deposition in the late Iron Age and the early Roman period a few years ago now. Uh, particularly when it comes to kind of burial practices, so um, the disarticulated human remains. Um, and uh, by looking at this, I, I, when this excellent volume came out in 2018, I believe, uh, I was looking specifically for that. Unfortunately, as part of that project, there wasn't a, there was a huge amount of investigation. Uh, and this is because of the, the massive breadth and scope of this project and all of the data that they had to deal with. But they did show... Um, have some uh, preliminary discussions about this data, uh, how the um, disarticulated human remains on rural settlement sites were concentrated in certain areas, and that they may have extended as a practice throughout the Roman period, which is in, is in contrast to kind of the more traditional view, which suggests that it uh, dies off after the early Roman period. So I wanted to talk you through um, you know, what I did, how you could reuse some of this information in your own research uh, if you were interested in, under, in using this data set in specific, uh, specifically. But I just wanted to, oh, excuse me, um, warn you that this is a, a, a case in progress. This is something I'm working on right now and will continue to do so. Um, but there'll be a link at the end for all of this research and data for you to have a look at and to reuse in your own way. So here's the map from uh, that volume, which shows the extent of sites with disarticulated human remains on them. And as you can see, they seem to have a correlation, particularly in the central area, with sites with burials on them. So the authors do warn that perhaps this uh, distribution of disarticulated human remains uh, might be related to um, disturbed graves. So uh, something to consider in terms of the wider context of your data. In how uh, I went about this, um, it started from looking at the data on the ADS. Here's the database uh, relationship uh, diagram, which shows how all of the data tables fit together. Okay, So if you're looking at a particular element that you want to research in more detail, this is a good place to start because it shows you what information you'll need to download and how you'll need to link it together. Okay. So here's the elements that I was looking at, which is uh, the burial data on the far hand right hand side. But I also knew that if I wanted to understand a bit more about the geographical location or the context of that burial data, I needed to have both the core data, which uh, includes geographical information, and the site data, which includes the description of those rural settlement sites. So I took those three files, uh, extracted them from the archive, and uh, and reused those by rejoining them together. Now I've provided a instructions for how you go about this process, and it's uh, uh, saved on my uh, GitHub account here. Um, and I'll share this link afterwards if people are interested in reusing it. Uh, but it's just a short how to user guide, five to six pages on how to use uh, Roman rural settlement data. In terms of how I undertook the analysis or how I 
pulled this all together, I used R, that's my peripheral uh, software. And this little snippet here on the left-hand side is just showing you how easy it is to import the data and rejoin it all together. So this code, and I'm not gonna go through it in detail, just shows you how you can read that data, join it together as a single database, um, determine the amount of entries that we're really dealing with, and then export it again. That's how easy it can be. And this could be interchanged with any of the other data that you saw on the Roman Rule Settlement download page. Um, and I've included this code as well on my GitHub account so that you can reuse it to your heart's content. From this rejoining section, what it really showed me is that there's about 1,500 sites uh, in the database which have burial information associated with them. And as we filter by the um, disarticulated human remains, we're uh, left with about 450 sites. So that's a good set of data to, to, to work with and to try and uh, uh, get some information out of, which is what I went about doing. So essentially, I looked first at the distribution of these sites, okay? Uh, and the regions that you see at the bottom there were the ones that were defined by the original project. Um, but as you can see quite quickly, uh, the central area of the country, which they call the central belt, seems to have the highest quantity of sites with uh, disarticulated human remains. This central belt extends from the east coast to the west coast, uh, and uh, crosses the, the Midlands as well. So it's quite a large area, which is why then I delve into that area specifically. Uh, and what we could tell is if we broke it down by uh, different modern counties, we could see that there are different, uh, there are settlements with disarticulated human remains in, in multiple counties, majoritively in Gloucestershire, Cambridgeshire and Oxfordshire. This suggests, based on the location of these, and this is without a distribution map, um, that we might have pockets of different activity, that it's not just one centralized area where we're having this, uh, this tradition or this practice, but it's happening on different sites in different areas. We then, or I then, I then plotted that by the types of settlement that were included in the database, okay? So, these definitions of settlement types at the bottom were also uh, um, um, defined by the original project. But it gives you an idea of what uh, gaps we really need to address, because as you can see, the vast quantity are, are settlement type that are called unclassified, which obviously isn't very helpful in terms of my uh, research, but it shows me that when I think about settlement type for this data set, I need to do a bit more of a deep dive into what that group, uh, that unclassified group uh, really um, occurs. Um, but what we do see here when you split by whether or not there's evidence for domestic op occupation is there's a large quantity of this uh, practice occurring on uh, domestic sites. And we need to look a little bit more detail again at the unclassified. Also looked by disarticulated human remains and size. And you can see the vast majority are found in small settlements. But again, we have a whole group here of uncertain uh, size settlements. These are settlements where the excavation hasn't been large enough to determine the exact extent. So they might be small or they might be large and further investigation is required. Uh, and therefore, uh, again, it provides us with a gap analysis of something to, deep, uh, to delve into deeper after uh, doing this analysis. And then I pose by uh, settlement sites and settlement type. The point of this slide is to show that the vast majority of settlements here are unclassified sites of uncertain size, which isn't particularly useful either, but it shows that this is something that we really need to, to look into in more detail. Topography type was also an element. These were all fields within the original database. I didn't have to add anything to this data. I just analyzed it after combining it. And it shows that the vast majority of, uh, of sites with disarticulated human remains are found in river valleys, um, which is interesting because there's a strong tradition, or particularly in the late Iron Age, of structured deposition in watery locations or contexts. Um, but we'd need to delve into this table a little bit more to understand what are the specific uh, positions in river valleys, how close do these sites need to be in river valleys to determine this as a characteristic. But an interesting correlation nonetheless. And then finally, I looked at the date of sites which contain disarticulated human remains. 
Uh, this is for all of the data set across England and Wales. Um, and it's worth noting that the day is based on the origin date of the settlement. So if a settlement uh, was founded in the first century AD and continued to the third century AD, it's only going to show up in, in the first century AD bar. So it's not talking about longevity, it's talking about origin date. And what we can see is there's a lot of uh, um, uh, um, settlement sites which are founded in the first century BC and AD, which suggests uh, you know, a more traditional uh, interpretation that um, uh, structured uh, deposition of human remains occurred in the late Iron Age and early Roman period. When we look at the central area, however, we get a slightly different picture, which is that we have a lot of sites which fall into the first century AD category. OK, so that might suggest that we have very late Iron Age uh, occupation of these sites, because you remember, you know, we're not getting to the end of the Iron Age until the mid first century AD, um, but it requires a little bit more deeper analysis. So that's just to show you what we could do with the data. As I can say, it's very early work. There's lots of more work, lots of future work to be done. And as I go along, um, I will update the uh, the GitHub account so you can see more of the research as it um, unfolds. But it's just to really demonstrate the untapped potential of this data set. I looked at one facet and I was able to uh, start uh, delving into the data and really pulling out some gap analysis. And as I reach towards uh, six o'clock, um, I just want to finish by really having a call to action, which is really thinking about what you should do in the future in terms of encouraging uh, fair data uh, access and reuse. And that's to consider archiving your data sets with a suitable repository, um, such as the ADS, but not necessarily the ADS. Um, think about uh, the opportunities for reusing data that we hold and, and really tell us if you have reused data. That would be great. We're always happy to hear from you uh, and to promote your research as well. Um, and to think about undertaking training in data management. And to give you a, a quick um, overview of some of these aspects, if you're interested in archiving with us, but you don't necessarily have the funds to do so, we do have an open access archaeology fund, uh, which um, provides institutional support, particularly uh, which provides support for those with no means of institutional support uh, for publishing with the, the, the Internet Archaeology or archiving with the ADS. So there's a link there if you're interested in that. Um, and there are other data sets, which I won't talk a lot about right now, but um, this presentation will be available afterwards for anybody who wants to look at. But if you're interested in brooches, there's a, a large data set here associated with uh, Don McCree's volume, uh, which was published in 2011. Uh, if you're interested in Mortaria, there's this uh, uh, data set by um, the expert Kay Huntley, um, which includes a whole series of downloads, including uh, rubber stamps of the pottery dyes. And if you're interested in geospatial data or geophysical data, you can look at this from the Silchester Mapping Project, which includes all of the GIS uh, shape files and the geophysical data as well. So lots of information there for you to potentially reuse in your own research. And if you're interested in training, that's something that we are developing right now. So keep an eye on the ADS website. But I'd also uh, say, you know, look at the data carpentry um, um, organization. They are excellent in terms of uh, data literacy for academics particularly. And if you're interested in R, I'd recommend this uh, repository by Ben Marwick, who looks at um, lots of archeology span publications that include R codes. So it's a good starting point. That's where I started my R journey from as well. If you're interested in this archive and this, uh, this data set, all of this information will be available on my GitHub repository. There's a DOI there that I will post in the chat afterwards. And I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, that would be great. If you want to contact me, then feel free to email me or, or catch me on Twitter. Thank you very much.